Welcome to Cyber's Introduction to Application Security. My name is Christoph Limpeler, and I will be your instructor for the course. Now, before we talk about the interesting parts of application security, I do want to spend just a few minutes talking about who the course is for and what you will walk away with after taking the course. But first, who am I? Now, as I mentioned, my name is Christoph, and I was originally born in France, but then moved to the US. And as a result of that move, I didn't have a whole lot of friends, and so I turned to computers and spent more time tinkering with them than I cared to admit, and thus began my long journey of learning how to program. I also ventured in other areas, and it became very clear early on that my interests lied in technology. Now, fast forward to a few years ago, and I jumped feet first into the world of cloud services, especially with Amazon Web Services, where I taught thousands of people on how to pass associate and professional level certifications. Today, I work with our awesome team at Cyber to help make the world more secure. Now, I had to learn application security the hard way. After having spent time with PHP frameworks, I decided to explore plain PHP without the help of libraries and frameworks to understand how those libraries and frameworks were working behind the scenes. So I built a simple scheduling application to schedule and show rental houses. And it worked fine, but the mistake I made was that I uploaded the application to the internet. And you can probably guess where I'm going with this. Within a couple of days, my web application and database were compromised. Now, nothing serious came of it, thankfully, but I did learn a lot of really good lessons from that. One of those lessons was to never use plain PHP again if I could avoid it. For one, it's extremely inefficient since you're reinventing the wheel, and second, it is going to be less secure. Open source frameworks and libraries have hundreds, if not thousands of people looking at them and making improvements, testing for security issues, and so on. Now, that's not to say that they don't have issues of their own, which we'll explore further in the course, but you get the idea. So I embarked on a journey to figure out how my application was compromised so quickly and easily. And after a few years of figuring it out, here I am today. Now this course is going to be more conceptual and higher level since it is an introductory level course, but in the future we will release courses that go deeper dive into application security. That way you can get your hands dirty learning with real world examples. Now with that, we also assume a few things and consider the following to be prerequisites. For one, we assume that you have at least a couple of years of programming experience. The language doesn't really matter, at least in regards to this course, but if you don't have any programming experience, this is probably not a course that you wanna start with. We also assume that you're familiar with typical software development models, software engineering in general, and just the basics of application development. Because in order to secure applications, you have to be able to quickly navigate and understand frameworks, languages, and code that you may not be familiar with. And you also need to have some familiarity with the platform that the code is running on. So if you're focusing on web development, you should know some basic Linux. Or if you're focusing on mobile application security and development, then you should know iOS or Android or maybe both and so on. Now we'll talk more about application security job requirements in the next lesson, but at the end of the day, you will be spending the bulk of your time analyzing source code, manipulating requests between your application and backend services, and trying to find holes in the application security. And if you've never touched a line of code before, you simply won't be able to do this. So I'd recommend that you pause here and enroll in programming courses that pique your interest. But if you're still watching, I'm excited to get started. By the end of this course, you will walk away with a thorough understanding of application security concepts and how they relate to web, mobile, and cloud applications so that you can then dive deeper into those respective areas depending on your interests and or job requirements. And now let's mark this lesson as complete and let's move on to the next lesson where we explore application security jobs. We've become so accustomed to seeing reports like this and this and this, which all happened in the last couple of years. And we're talking about very public hacks on organizations that have massive budgets compared to small businesses. And while all of these hacks could have been avoided, the fact of the matter is that this is complicated business. In fact, it's so complicated that organizations hire individuals to take care of securing their applications. Or sometimes they even hire entire teams or even entire departments to take care of this stuff. Now, if you're here, you're probably interested in getting a job in application security, or maybe you already work in the field and you're just looking to formalize your training. This lesson is geared more towards the people who are looking to enter this field, and this is their starting point. So this lesson aims to answer questions that you most likely have, such as what kinds of jobs can I get with application security skills? What are the requirements for those jobs? What kinds of salaries can I expect, etc. Now let's start with the first question since it will help us answer all the others. Let's start with what kinds of jobs can you find with application security skills? 
There are a number of different search engines that you can use to find jobs online, but in this case, we're just using the basic Google job search. From here, you can select a location or any other filter that you want. And in my case, I'll just select Austin, Texas. And as you can see, there are a lot of different positions on the left-hand side with different titles, but that all tie back to application security. For example, application security engineer, application security engineer here as well, application security architect here, product security engineer, a senior security application engineer, even application security managers, and more. But if we click on these different jobs, we can look at the requirements, and in some cases, they also post the salary range. So this is for a biotech company, and if we look at the requirements, it says one year presenting and working in compliance, privacy, IT, networking, or related functions, two to three years of experience with reading and understanding product code built with Python, Java, Go, and other languages, web application security, cloud security, architecture and infrastructure, source code auditing, performing threat models, reviewing new features and architectural designs. And these are some of the topics that we will cover in the course, though not all of them, but that gives us a good idea for this job. Next, we can look at a post by Atlassian for an application security engineer. Again, we can look at some of the requirements. Here it does say a solid understanding of web application security, experience with cloud security, architecture and infrastructure, something we will touch on in this course. Again, experience coding, and we've talked about this an ability to reason about security decisions, ability to communicate ideas clearly and effectively to engineers who know way more than you about their code. This is an important topic that we will touch on more and more. And also something to keep in mind, being able to communicate to a group of engineers would be very important in this position. We can continue to look at different ones. For example, one here by HashiCorp. This one is a senior application security engineer, but just to get an idea of what that looks like. There are definitely a lot more requirements here. They even name out Amazon Web Services, Azure, or Google Cloud Platform, so knowing cloud is important. Security design, architecture and threat modeling, vulnerabilities and options for defense and mitigation, and a whole lot more. So, so far, just by looking at two or three different postings, a lot of these will also include requirements to be familiar with cloud and cloud security, like AWS, for example. And this is a topic, like I said, that we do cover a little bit in this course. But if you see any position that piques your interest in particular, look at those requirements and compare to your current skill set. And then at the end of this course, you will have a better idea of where your knowledge gaps are so that you can focus in those areas. And again, not all of these postings have salary ranges, but you can get an idea by scrolling to the bottom and looking at the typical pay for this type of work. Each of these postings should have something similar. But also keep in mind that you can go to these respective websites, such as Indeed, Glassdoor, Salary.com, Pesa, and other ones, and you can put in your location, your experience level, and other important factors, and they can give you a salary range. So looking at all these questions, here's what we can generalize so far. Salary ranges are always really hard because they depend on too many factors. But when I looked at positions in Austin for entry level, most of them had a starting salary of just about $80,000. So getting to six figures is definitely achievable either right away or as you get more experience under your belt. And as an application or software security engineer, you can expect to develop and write new or even modify existing computer applications or software or utility programs. And you have to do that following security best practices. So it's important that you understand what those security best practices are, and that is a big part of this course. You can also be expected to secure new or existing applications that others have developed, which means that you need to be able to understand and analyze other people's code, ensure that this code meets software security best practices, and that it aligns with your business's risk appetite. Now, this all means that you need to put yourself in the shoes of an attacker and identify the potential different paths through your application that attackers can use to do harm to the business. So you need to be able to think through not just the code, but the entire application as a whole. Because that application likely speaks to a database, likely has authentication, sends information over a network, et cetera. And these are all attack vectors that must be kept in mind. Now, all this does not mean that you need to be super familiar with infrastructure security or networking security because your organization or the organization that you're going to work in may have teams dedicated to that. But if you're part of a smaller organization, like maybe a small startup, you may have to wear those hats because no one else in the organization is able or even has time to do that. 
So I highly recommend that you at least familiarize yourself with those different areas, even if you're going to specialize in application security specifically, that way you can speak about it intelligently. Now, as we wrap up this lesson, in the next lesson, we are going to explore something called the NICE framework and OWASP. And these two things will give us blueprints to better understand what's required from us to enter the application security field in terms of specialty areas, in terms of skills, knowledge, abilities, and things like that. So go ahead and complete this lesson, and I'll see you in the next lesson where we explore this in a lot more detail. In the previous video, we talked about application security as a job, and we even looked at different job postings to see what kinds of requirements we could expect. But wouldn't it be nice if there were a nice framework that could tell us what to focus on? Okay, I admit that was pretty cheesy, but you do have to admit that it is a clever acronym. The National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education came up with a cybersecurity workforce framework, but that takes way too long to say, so they've abbreviated it to just calling it the NICE framework. In any case, it was developed in partnerships with NICE, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and the Department of Homeland Security to provide educators, students, employers, employees, training providers, and even policymakers with a systematic and consistent way to organize the way that we think and talk about cybersecurity work, and to identify the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed to perform cybersecurity tasks. Again, way too much, so in short, let's just say that it's a blueprint to help you organize, categorize, and describe cybersecurity work. And in fact, let's go ahead and just pull up the framework online so we can see exactly what it's like. Now that we're on the official website page for this, and by the way, you can go to this URL to follow along, we can now see the different categories and specialty areas, and then we can break it further into work roles, tasks, and the SKAs. In our case, we're gonna scroll down to the category that is called securely provision. From there, you can see all the different specialty areas like risk management, software development, and so on. And in our case, we'll click on software development. You may be asked to enter for a brief survey. I'll just say no thanks in this case. But once we're on the specialty area page, you can now see the different work roles. So in this case, we have software developer and we have secure software assessor. And within those different work roles, we have the abilities that are broken down here the knowledge, the skills, the tasks. So these represent the SKAs and then the tasks and then finally the capability indicators. Now in this course, obviously we're not going to have the time to cover every single SKA or even task, but you can then take what you've learned from the course and fill in your other gaps thanks to this framework and I highly recommend that you spend more time looking over all of this after you've completed this lesson so that you can familiarize yourself with these lists and so that you can take a good look at where you are currently and where you need to be in order to figure out what gaps and skills you need to fill. Now, of course, comparing this list to what we looked at in the prior lesson with different job postings, you'll start to realize that not all of the different jobs will require everything that's listed in these lists. So you don't have to have all the knowledge, skills, and abilities that the NICE framework spells out. And don't worry about learning all of those in a month or two months. That's not what we're saying here. Instead, use this as a frame of reference. So that's the NICE framework in a nutshell. Now let's take a look at OWASP. The Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP for short, is a nonprofit foundation that aims to improve the security of software, and they do this by being vendor agnostic. They provide a breadth of resources and standards to help developers improve the security of software, and we will be leaning heavily on their work throughout the remainder of this course. That way you can reference their projects during the course, but also after you've taken the course and when it's time to apply what you've learned on the job or even on personal projects. Plus, if you're in this industry, you will often hear people reference OWASP so that the next time someone mentions it, you know exactly what they're talking about. Let's take a quick look at their project so that you can see what I mean. They have a number of different projects, but let's focus on the flagship projects. And you can also scroll down and you'll see the section right here. So the flagship projects right now are labeled as green flags. They also have different lab projects. But if we focus on the flagship projects, we will see multiple different types of projects, some of which we will explore in this course. For example, the application security verification standard. We'll look at some of the cheat sheet series. We'll also look at the mobile security testing guide, the OWASP mobile top 10. We'll look at the risk assessment framework, the security knowledge framework, 
We'll also look at the OWASP web top 10 and the web security testing guide. So these are some of the flagship projects that we'll take a look at, but feel free to also scroll through and look at some of their various projects, which can be extremely helpful. And as you can see, this is a rich library that you can reference over and over again throughout your career. Now, I'm not gonna lie, looking at this list gets me pretty excited. So I hope you feel the same way because we are going to be spending time looking at these different projects. All right, go ahead and mark this lesson as complete and move on to the next, where we dive into critical concepts of application security. To produce a secure application, you have to first define what secure means for that application. Because if you don't have this defined, then how can the team possibly know where to focus? And it's also much easier to build security from the ground up baked into the application versus retrofitting that in an existing application that was not built with security in mind. But of course, that's not always possible. Maybe you're inheriting an older application or you've got a set of APIs that are mature and that have drifted over time. Regardless of the situation that you find yourself in, start with a baseline and then build on top of that. So that's exactly what we're going to do in this section of the course. We're going to start building that baseline. But even just building a baseline can seem like a very daunting task because there are so many areas that we could focus on and how do we know where to focus on first? Well, luckily for us, as we saw in the prior lessons, OWASP has a number of different projects and some of those projects can help us with building that foundation. So in this lesson, we're going to look at the OWASP Application Security Verification Standard, or ASVS for short, as a guide for setting our security requirements baseline for our applications. You can find this by going to Projects and then Browse All Projects and scroll down until you see the OWASP Application Security Verification Standard and on the right hand side, you'll find the different downloads. We've also got it pulled up here as a PDF link. So if you go to this URL, you'll have the in-browser PDF version. As we go through this lesson, keep in mind that OWASP has separated standards for mobile application security. So while this lesson is focusing more on web and cloud application security baselines, we will also look at the mobile application security verification standard in the mobile section of this course. As we get familiar with these projects, it will be easier to look at mobile specific ones. So even if you're primarily interested in mobile application security, this lesson is still relevant. Now the application security verification standard, which I'll refer to as the ASVS from now on, is currently on version 4.0 from 2019, which is the latest version at the time of this recording in 2020. And it has these objectives. To provide us with a measurement on how much trust we can place in our web application security, to provide guidance as to what we should build into our security controls to satisfy security requirements, and to provide a standard for application security verification requirements in contracts with third parties. So essentially, the ASVS is a catalog of security requirements and the verification criteria that we can use for all of our projects. And it does that with three different verification levels. ASV level one is for low assurance levels. ASV level two, is for applications that contain sensitive data and is the recommended level for most applications. And then ASVS level three is for the most critical of applications. Each level has a list of security requirements defined by this standard, and this is what it looks like. Now this will make more sense as we look at the actual requirements, but using these requirements and levels, we can start to create our own secure coding checklist specific to our application. Now, if we determine that our API or application is at a level one because it doesn't contain or touch any sensitive data whatsoever, and that it can get by with the absolute bare minimum, then we will approach it differently than if we deem it to be a level two or level three. Level one is also useful as a first step in a multi-phase approach, so it can act as a good starting point, but in a lot of cases, it should not be your endpoint. Now, the ASVS summarizes level one as having security controls that can be checked automatically by tools or manually without accessing the source code. These security measures can thwart the most basic attacks who use simple and low effort techniques to identify easy to find and easy to exploit vulnerabilities, but they will fall apart with the most determined attackers and more sophisticated attacks. Now the ASVS deems level one to be the absolute minimum that all applications should strive for. The unfortunate reality is that many applications that are in production right now don't even meet level one requirements. So if you find yourself in that situation, that's fine. Just aim for level one, even if you need to be at level two or even level three potentially, start with level one and then iterate on top of that to get to the other levels. 
Level 2 aims to defend against most of the risks associated with software today. This is a level that many businesses should aim to have, especially to protect their business critical areas. Level 3 is the highest level defined by the standard, and it requires in-depth analysis of architecture and code and in-depth testing that goes far beyond the automated tools or online scans. This is a level that you should attain if a successful attack would significantly impact your organization's operations or even its survival. Now this level, of course, requires much more investment, which is why the standard labels level two as the recommended level for most applications. But at the end of the day, you're the expert in regards to your applications, so it is up to you to determine which level fits your needs. Now knowing these three levels, let's continue exploring the ASVS in order to understand the different security categories and the different requirements that represent best practices for each category. Since the list of categories and requirements is quite lengthy, we won't have time to explore all of them, but let's take a look at a few examples so that we can get the hang of it. The ASVS contains categories such as authentication, access control, error handling and logging, web services, and others. Each category contains a collection of requirements that represent the best practices for that category, and they are written to be verifiable statements. For example, with v1.1.1, which is to verify the use of a secure software development lifecycle that addresses security in all stages of development, for level 1, it is not a requirement, but for levels 2 and 3, it is a requirement. So in this case, since we're verifying this statement, it's either a yes or no. If yes, check it. If no, don't check it. If we go down to v1.2, which is about authentication architectural requirements, and we look at v1.2.1, which is to verify the use of unique or special low privilege operating system accounts for all application components, services, and servers. Again, not a requirement for level one, but it is a requirement for level two and level three. And so you can get the idea. Now, obviously, there's a whole lot more to the ASVS than we have time to cover in this lesson. So after marking this lesson as complete, please spend a little bit more time reviewing the requirements and getting more familiar with those requirements. In the next lesson, we're going to explore another framework called OWASP SAM, or Software Assurance Maturity Model, which was donated to and is now maintained by OWASP. So go ahead and mark this lesson as complete, and I'll see you in the next one. SAM stands for Software Assurance Maturity Model, and it's a model that helps understand the core building blocks of a secure software program from a more macro point of view. It provides a self-assessment model for all types of organizations to use, whether you're large or small. It is technology and process agnostic, and it supports the complete software lifecycle. Now, SAM has three main characteristics. It is measurable with defined maturity levels, similar to the levels that we saw in the ASVS from the prior lessons. It is actionable with clear paths for improving those maturity levels. And it is versatile by being technology, process, and organization agnostic. This makes SAM a great tool to help analyze your organization's current security stance so that you can define iterations to improve and then show progress towards those iterations with actual measurements. So let's take a look at how SAM is structured. And we're gonna do this with a few different ways. The first way is by accessing it from the website by going to the model, and you can see it here. They also have a PDF version, so this is the second way. And you can download or view the PDF from GitHub. And I've also tried to make it more legible, so let's take a look at that with the third way. At the highest level, SAM defines five critical business functions. And those business functions are categories of activities related to software development. The first one is governance. And governance focuses on processes and activities for how an organization manages software development. It includes cross-functional groups involved in development and business processes established at the organizational level. The second one is design, which concerns processes and activities related to how an organization defines goals and creates software within development projects. And this usually includes requirements gathering, high-level architecture specification, and detailed design. Next, we have implementation, which is focused on processes and activities related to how an organization builds and deploys software components and its related defects. And the goal here is to ship reliably working software with minimum defects. Then we have verification, of course, which is the focus on processes and activities related to how the organization checks and tests the artifacts that we've produced through software development. This typically includes QA work, such as testing, but it can also include other review activities. 
And then finally, we have the operations, which encompasses activities that are necessary to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability are maintained through the lifetime of an application and all of its data. Now, for each of these business functions, SAM defines three security practices each. So there are 15 security practices in total that are independent silos for improvement and that all map back to the five business functions of software development that we just looked at. So for governance, the security practices are strategy and metrics, which forms the basis of your secure software activities by building an overall plan. There are policy and compliance, which drives the adherence to internal and external standards and regulations, and then education and guidance, which focuses on increasing the knowledge in the organization regarding secure software, just like we're doing right now. Now keep in mind that I am pulling these descriptions and this chart data from the PDF and the website. So if you're following along, you can absolutely do that. Then for design, our security practices are threat assessments, which focus on identifying potential threats in applications. Then we have security requirements, which focuses on defining appropriate security requirements for your software and your software suppliers. And then we have security architecture, which focuses on managing architectural risks for the software solution. For implementation, we have secure build, which is creating a consistently repeatable build process and accounting for the security of application dependencies. We have secure deployment, which is all about increasing the security of software deployments to the production environment and the supporting secrets. And then we have defect management, which is managing security defects in the software and the associated metrics. For verification, we have architecture assessment, which is validating the security and the compliance of the software and the supporting infrastructure architecture. We have requirements driven testing using both positive, i.e. control verification and negative like misuse and abuse testing or security tests based on requirements like user stories. And if you're not familiar with that, we will look at this a little bit more in the future. And then finally, we have security testing, which is detection and resolution of basic security issues through automation and allowing manual testing to focus on the more complex attack vectors. Finally, for operations, we have incident management, which addresses activities carried out to improve the organization's detection of and the response to security incidents. We have environment management, which describes proactive activities carried out to improve and maintain the security of the environments in which the organization's applications operate. And then operational management, which focuses on operational support activities that are required to maintain the security throughout the product lifecycle. So go ahead and take a brief moment to read these descriptions, either now or after you complete the lesson, by going either to the website or to that PDF document. If you're not familiar with what you're reading yet, or if you don't fully understand it, don't worry. As we go along the course, it will start to make more sense. But at least now you have the foundation and we can tie this back to specific frameworks. Now for each of these security practices that we're looking at right here, Sam defines three different maturity levels as objectives. And the three maturity levels are more sophisticated to implement than the prior one. So level one is easiest, level three is more sophisticated. And so as a result, they also have more stringent success metrics. And we saw varying levels of maturity in the ASVS, so this is not a new concept, but an organization does not have to meet all of the maturity levels since they may not all be relevant to the organization. And so you may choose to prioritize some over others. So it's important to keep that in mind and not feel overwhelmed when trying to implement this. But so for each of these security practices, we have the different maturity levels, but we also have two different streams and we haven't seen this before. Streams have objectives to be reached and those objectives are tied to the different levels. So they also increase in complexity. For example, if we look at the strategy and metric security practice, there are two different streams. Stream A is to create and promote and level one aims to identify organization drivers as they relate to the organization's risk tolerance. Whereas level two is to publish a unified strategy for application security, and level three is to align the application security program to support the organization's growth. But then for stream B, we have measure and improve, and level one defines metrics with insight into the effectiveness and efficiency of the application security program. Whereas level two sets targets and KPIs for measuring the program's effectiveness. And finally, level three is to influence the strategy based on the metrics and organizational needs. 
So obviously level three takes more time and is more sophisticated to implement. But as you can see, that's a really good goal to strive towards. So you can start with level one, then build on top of that to level two, and then build on top of that to level three. But again, not all of these may be relevant to your organization. So keep that in mind. So Sam breaks down all of this into even more detail, including assessment questions and quality criteria to measure the progress and whether objectives have been met or not. So instead of just looking at this theory, you can incrementally build towards that and you can show that to the rest of your organization, to your leadership and so on. So this is a very effective and helpful framework. This is another lengthy document with a lot to chew on. So go ahead and take the time after completing this lesson to read through this document in a little bit more detail. Once you've got the hang of it, go ahead and move on to the next lesson where we explore the top 10 proactive controls that should be included in every single software development project. Now that we've looked at how to create a baseline for our applications with the ASVS and SAM, it's time to talk about the practical approaches to implementing some of the most important security requirements in our projects. Because all of the knowledge in the world won't help if we can't apply it. So to help with this, let's look at the OWASP proactive controls, which is a list of security techniques that should be included in every software development project. The OWASP top 10 proactive controls can be found at this URL. You can also find it by going through projects, browse all projects, and look for proactive controls. This list is ordered in terms of importance. So we'll start from the very top with C1, defining security requirements. You may remember in the application security verification standard that some of the requirements had links with a C and a number like C1 for V1.1.1. These map back directly to these proactive controls. So C1 maps back to defining security requirements. And so now we can start to see how these are all tied to work together. This control explains how to grab the requirements that we've seen in prior lessons and to turn them into user stories and misuse cases. User stories, as long as you've been programming for a couple of years at least, should not be a new concept. It takes the perspective of a user or even administrator and it describes the functionality of what a user wants the system to do for them. For example, if we look at v2.1.1, which is to verify that user set passwords are at least 12 characters in length, and this is a requirement for level ones through three, user stories might be, as a user, I can enter a password that has a minimum of 12 characters. And another one might be, as a user, I can enter my username and password to gain access to the application. While a misuse case is a story focused on the attacker and their actions. So it might look like this. As an attacker, I can find passwords shorter than 12 characters. Breaking down those ASVS requirements into misuse cases or user stories helps make them more testable for us and for our teams. Now at this point, you might look at me and you might say, hey, Christoph, that's great, but it's literally going to take us weeks or even months to break all of this down into different user stories and misuse cases. But luckily, OWASP is a step ahead of us because they've outlined four steps to implementation. As we talk about these steps, think about how they will fit in your existing or even future development lifecycle. Step number one is discovery and selection. Now you're not meant to tackle all of it at one time. Instead, look through the list of requirements from the ASVS and or any other custom requirements that you've deemed necessary for your application and prioritize those. Break them down into a manageable amount per release or sprint, and then continue adding more security functionality in each sprint over time. As we will see in a different lesson on threat modeling, there is a different way of prioritizing risk based on threats, so we will be revisiting prioritization in a future lesson. Step number two is to investigate and document. During the investigation and documentation phase, review the existing application and compare it against the security requirements that you've outlined as necessary. And then from there, figure out which requirements your application meets and which requirements still need development. And make sure to document the investigation so that it remains accurate over time. Step three is to implement. After you've investigated and documented your findings of deficiency, it's time to turn that into action like we just talked about and either modify the application to add the new security functionality or eliminate the insecure option. And then we've got step four, which is to test. Implementing the changes just isn't enough. As the final step, you have to create those test cases in order to confirm whether the modified functionality solves that requirement or not. And if it doesn't, then go back to the implementation phase. 
But if it does, then it's time to update documentation and then move on to the next requirement. And as we wrap up control number one, reflect on the fact that this control, which is deemed to be the most important out of the top 10 by OWASP, is not about a specific threat. Instead, it's about building a process that has security in mind from the very beginning instead of being an afterthought. All right, so that's control number one of the proactive controls. Let's take a look at C2, which is to leverage security frameworks and libraries. This control focuses on third-party frameworks and libraries, which provide a ton of value, but can also introduce nasty vulnerabilities if it's not managed properly. And we'll talk more about this later in the course, but go ahead and review this control now or after completing the lesson. C3 is about securing database access. An important sentence to highlight on this page is that SQL or SQL injections, depending on if you come from Linux or Windows background, is one of the most dangerous application security risks. Chances are high that you've heard of SQL injections because they happen way too frequently and they can do serious damage, like exposing entire databases that can contain critical data such as passwords and medical or financial records. And this is another important topic that we will revisit in the course and that I recommend you spend more time reading about on this page. Next, we'll look at C4, which is encoding and escaping data. Again, you've likely heard of cross-site scripting attacks and encoding slash escaping is a defense against these types of attacks. C5 is all about validating all inputs, which will also help defend against cross-site scripting, SQL injection, gaining elevated privileges, or other forms of attack. So make sure you spend some time reviewing this page. Next, we've got C6, which is implementing digital identities to provide guidance in terms of authentication and session management. Now they define digital identity as the unique representation of a user or other object as they engage in an online transaction. Authentication is the process of verifying that an individual or entity is who they claim to be, while session management is a process by which a server maintains the state of that user's authentication so that they can continue to use the system without having to re-authenticate just like when you're browsing a website and all of a sudden it asks you to log in again. Now what's particularly interesting on this page is that we revisit a level similar to what we saw in the ASVS. The NIST 800-63B, which is a guideline from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, outlines three levels of authentication assurance, with level one being for lower risk applications, they only require passwords for authentication, but with other requirements listed below. Level two, instead, requires multi-factor authentication with a combination of a password or PIN, a token or phone, and or biometrics. And then level three requires cryptographic based authentication, which is providing proof of possession of a key through a cryptographic protocol, usually done through hardware cryptographic modules. Now be sure to read the rest of this page for more information on digital identities. But moving on, we then have C7, which is enforcing access controls. And this is different from authentication since it looks at processing access for specific requests compared to verifying identity. C8 is to protect data everywhere. Data such as passwords, credit cards, health information, etc. This is where understanding concepts such as encryption in transit, at rest, and in use comes into play. Now C9 is about implementing security logging and monitoring. This is something else that we'll definitely take a look at again in the course. And then finally, C10 is handling all errors and exceptions. If you've ever used an application that crashed or gave you an error message and it contained what seemed like sensitive information, then you'll immediately know why this control is important. If we don't handle failure gracefully, attackers can use that to their advantage. Like maybe they see an error code that shows them that there is a vulnerability. Now one more observation before we move on is that each of these controls have references and tools. I highly recommend that you start looking at those or at least bookmark them for when you're ready to review them. Now again, this is a starting point, but as you go through this list, think about your custom application and organization and think through any other controls that you may want to add in your checklists. And of course, if you're already working on an application or project, or if you have one in mind for the future, think about how these top 10 controls can be applied to your projects. Now, these are topics that we're going to explore again in the web, mobile, and cloud sections. So while I went through this list rather quickly, please take some time after completing this lesson 
to briefly review them, and don't worry, we will revisit a lot of these proactive controls. After that, go ahead and mark this lesson as complete, and I'll see you in the next one. Everything we've looked at so far has helped us come up with a baseline for what application security means and how to approach such a large undertaking in smaller incremental steps. But at the end of the day, every organization and every application has its own custom requirements. So we're going to look at another project that helps us create threat models specific to our requirements. These threat models are important to create and consider even before we start testing, because if we don't know where to focus, then we'll probably end up fixing vulnerabilities that are not the highest threats and not the highest priorities, which is a waste of time and a waste of effort. Or worse, what if you release a vulnerability into production and someone compromises it? You don't want to be figuring out how to respond to that and how to figure out its severity in the heat of the moment. Instead, if you have threat and risk modeling up front, you have a playbook that helps you react to that compromise. Now, one thing to keep in mind, especially depending on the organization that you're part of, especially if it's a larger organization, you're probably not going to be the one creating that threat and risk model. Instead, it will be handed down to you. I still think it's important to understand where and how that comes from since you will inherit that and you'll have to apply that in fixing the most important vulnerabilities first. Now the risk modeling approach that we're going to cover today is from an OWASP project as well. So this is what it looks like. It builds on top of the standard risk model of risk equals likelihood times impact. And it solves for this equation using six different steps. The first step is identifying risk. With step number one, a tester needs to think through different scenarios and will usually want to look at the worst case scenarios. Once we've identified a potential risk, we need to estimate how likely it is to happen by using a low, medium, or high rating. And we get these ratings by ranking different factors. Let's take a quick look at what I mean with step number two of factors for estimating likelihood. For there to be a threat, there has to be at least one threat agent. How technically skilled is this person or group of people? What kind of motive might they have? Is there a lot of potential reward where rewards are often tied to money, but not always? and what kind of resources and opportunities are required for that threat agent to find and exploit this vulnerability, and how large is the group of threat agents? Is it just one person or is it a full team? All these factors are very important to determine. And as we can see, each answer comes with a ranking number from zero to nine, nine being the highest likelihood and zero being the lowest likelihood. Next, we look at vulnerability factors. And we do that with the goal of estimating how likely it is that a particular vulnerability will be both discovered and exploited. So to do that, we need to look at the ease of discovery, which is how easy it is for the threat agent to discover that vulnerability. And rankings suggested here are practically impossible, difficult, easy, and automated tools available, meaning that the threat agent could run an automated tool to find that vulnerability. Then there's the ease of exploit. And this is different because perhaps a vulnerability might be easy to find, but maybe it's not so easy to exploit. And then we do have awareness, where we're ranking how well known that vulnerability is to the threat agent. And finally, how likely is it to be detected? Will it be detected by our application? Will it be logged and then later reviewed? Logged without a review or not logged at all? After going through step two, we'll have enough information to determine the likelihood, but that by itself is not enough because even if something's extremely likely to happen, if it has virtually no impact, then it's probably not worth spending time on. So with step number three, we're going to look at estimating the impact. And OWASP reminds us that there isn't just the technical impact on an application that a successful attack brings, but instead there's also the business impact. So when estimating that impact, we have to put both of those factors into the equation. The technical impact factors take into account the magnitude of the impact on the system if the vulnerability were to be successfully exploited. And there is the loss of confidentiality, the loss of integrity, of availability, and of accountability. On the other hand, the business impact factors instead take a look at financial damage, reputation damage, non-compliance, or even privacy violations. Now these are a great starting point, but as always, keep in mind that we can add our own custom ones for our business or for our technical impacts. And we're now at step number four. With step number four, we can look at all the ratings that we've worked on to this point and give them that low, medium, or high impact. Low is for zero to less than three, medium is for three to less than six, and high is for six to nine. 
And this is a fairly simple model, but OWASP does outline a more advanced calculation that they call the repeatable model. Please take a quick look after completing this lesson to get familiar with how it works. But as we move on, let's say for the sake of example, that a certain threat that we're evaluating has a medium likelihood of being exploited, just as in this example. It also has a high technical impact, but it does have a low business impact. In that case, OWASP recommends going with the business impact over the technical impact, as long as we can trust that business impact analysis. So even if the technical impact would be high, like in this case, since the business impact is low, we would overall set the severity to low. And we could have an opposite example where the technical impact is low, but the business impact is high, making that overall severity high. And going through this exercise is important because it helps us decide what to fix first, which leads us to step number five. Now, even if you could fix a bunch of low severity risks in a short period of time and just one or two high severity risks in that same period of time, you still want to go after the high severity risks. And I say that because, and I'm guilty of this myself, but a lot of us will tend to go after the low hanging fruit. So we might look at an easy vulnerability to fix, even if it's low impact, we might think, oh, you know what, I'll start there and then work up to the high severity and longer tasks. But you want to do the opposite. All right, now let's wrap up with risk number six, which is to customize the risk rating model. And we've talked about this throughout the course, but it bears repeating here especially. If you just grab what you see on this page and you don't attempt to customize it to your organization, it won't be effective in convincing leadership and it won't be effective in stamping out the biggest threats. Take what's here and customize the different factors and options until it makes sense for your organization and your application. And as you can see here, this page provides many references that go into much more detail for risk and threat modeling. Be sure to save these resources for when you tackle threat modeling for your app and your organization. Now with that in mind, let's go ahead and mark this lesson as complete and I'll see you in the next one. One more peg that we're going to add in order to support our baseline is exploring the OWASP cheat sheet series. Up until this point, we've looked at the application security verification standard, SAM, proactive controls, and threat modeling. Just between those different projects, we could spend weeks or even months going through everything only to just forget all about it when you actually need it. So the awesome group at OWASP created this cheat sheet that we're going to look at in this lesson, and I highly recommend that you bookmark it and continuously reference it. You can find the cheat sheet at this URL. On the left hand side, we have a convenient table of contents that lets us quickly jump to relevant areas. Let's start with the index for ASVS. So for V1.1 of Secure Software Development Lifecycle Requirements, they link to the Threat Modeling Cheat Sheet, the Abuse Case, and the Attack Surface Analysis Cheat Sheets. So this makes it very easy and convenient to go from the requirement that we're solving for to the cheat sheet associated with it. And the same thing goes for Proactive Controls, which has its own index. Now you'll quickly notice on the left hand side that not all of the cheat sheets may be relevant to you depending on the language that your application is coded in. Some of these are specific to PHP or Ruby on Rails or .NET and so on. But let's take a look at a few of these cheat sheets so that we can get the hang of it. And let's start with Ajax Security. Here we'll find a number of strong, straight to the point rules that can help us stay out of trouble. For example, the use of inner text instead of inner HTML. This can help prevent most cross-site scripting problems as it automatically encodes the text. Here it says don't use the eval function because it's evil and to never use it. If you're not familiar with JavaScript, eval executes JavaScript code. So if a malicious user manages to slip in bad code and that gets executed, well, you get the idea. And there are a few more to look over if you're using JavaScript and Ajax calls. We'll also take a look at another one, which is called PHP configuration. It includes a list of important configurations to be aware of and to modify, since oftentimes the defaults do not focus on security and instead they focus on ease of use. So this is another example of what you'll find in these cheat sheets. And I do encourage you to mark this lesson as complete and then explore relevant ones in more detail. Also be sure to bookmark this page because you'll be able to use it over and over again in the future. Then once you're ready, I'll see you in the next lesson.
Would you believe me if I told you that the vast majority of web applications in production today contain known vulnerabilities? And by known vulnerabilities, I literally mean vulnerabilities that have already been found and publicly reported. Well, you don't have to take my word for it. A MicroFocus 2019 application security risk report found that nearly all web apps have bugs in their security features. A Veracode State of Software Security Volume 10 report from 2019 shows that 83% of the 85,000 applications that they tested had at least one security flaw. Many had much more as their research found that a total of 10 million flaws and 20% of all applications had at least one high severity flaw. In fact, two in three applications failed to pass tests based on the OWASP top 10 list and the SANS top 25 most dangerous software errors. And these stats only account for known vulnerabilities. And to be fair, I'm sure that there are a number of them that are false positives, meaning that they tested positive with the automated tests, but in reality, if a human being checked them, they wouldn't actually be vulnerabilities. But on the flip side, these stats also don't account for zero-day vulnerabilities. A zero-day vulnerability is unknown or unaddressed. So for example, if you're looking to exploit an application and you find a vulnerability in that application that no one else has found or at least publicly reported, then you can continue to exploit that vulnerability until it is addressed. As a side note, zero-day vulnerabilities are exploited all the time, and there's a black market for them since they can be sold, and depending on the vulnerability, it could be sold for a serious amount of money. However, in more recent years, organizations have started to offer bug bounty programs in order to reward the findings of zero-day vulnerabilities to help avoid having these sold or even exploited, and instead to give the organizations a chance to fix them before they become public knowledge. But going back to the Veracode report, the most common types of flaws that they found were information leakage, cryptographic issues, CRLF injections, code quality, insufficient input validation, cross-site scripting, directory traversal, and credentials management. Now we're going to explore some of these in a bit more detail in the next lesson, but let's talk about the top three, just so we can make sure that we understand what they are. Information leakage refers to an application revealing sensitive data, such as technical details of an application, developer comments, environments, or user-specific data. That data can then be used by an attacker to exploit the target application, network, or even users. A basic example of this would be if a developer had added HTML or script comments to their code that contained sensitive information, and then they never removed it before it went to production. So in this case, we can see that the validate function in JavaScript has a comment that says to do add backend data sanitation. So if I'm an attacker, I may look at this and I may assume that the developers never went back and added data sanitation or they haven't gotten to it yet. And so that means that I may have a potential entry point. Another example of this would be improper application or server configurations or differences in page responses for valid versus invalid data. And if you've ever accessed a broken web page that released information about the database, web servers, or whatever else, then that could be considered information leakage. So information leakage by itself may not be a breach in security, but it can give crucial information to an attacker that can then be used to exploit your application or its infrastructure. The second one was cryptographic issues. And cryptographic issues can be problems related to encrypting the wrong data, leaving critical data exposed, improperly storing and managing crypto keys. So perhaps you're storing those in a GitHub repository and so other people have access to those keys, or maybe they're even publicly displayed because they weren't private repositories, and also using bad algorithms or trying to create and use your own algorithms. Unless you really, really, really know what you're doing, don't try to create your own. That doesn't make any sense. There are others out there that are working very well, so stick to those. Don't try to create your own. Next, we have CRLF injections. And these were the third most found flaws. Now, these can be very nasty attacks because the HTTP protocol uses what's called CRLF character sequences to signify where one header ends and another header begins. It also signifies where headers end and the website content begins. So in our example here, these are headers returned by Google. 
they have the location, the fact that it's returning via HTTP2, the content type, the date, the cache controls, the server that's returning it, the content length, and cross-site scripting protection flag, X-frame options flag, and things like that. There are many more, but these are just the ones that curl returned to us. But if attackers can insert their own CRLF, they can do all kinds of things, including redirecting users to a different website where they might create an identical version of your web page and use it for phishing. And they could also run unwanted commands on servers or do a whole lot of other things. And something that we haven't really talked about much to this point is chaining attacks together. So we've talked about cross-site scripting attacks a little bit, but what if an attacker uses CRLF to inject JavaScript code? In this case, they're chaining a CRLF injection with cross-site scripting. This is something that you would see a lot in the real world where one attacker may not use one specific attack method. They might use one attack method to gain access to something else, which then opens it up to other attack methods. And that's called chaining attacks. So let's take a look at what a CRLF injection might look like. First, we add a fake HTTP response header of content length zero. And I know it's hard to see because of all the encoding, but in this case, we cause the browser to treat it as a terminated response and begin parsing a new response because the content length is zero. Then we add a fake HTTP response with HTTP 200 OK, and that begins a new response. After that, we add another fake HTTP response header of content type, text, and HTML that's needed so that the browser knows how to properly parse the content. And then we add another fake HTTP response header that says content length 25. So in this case, the browser is expecting 25 bytes. And those 25 bytes are the cross-site scripting attack that in this case is very basic. It just creates an alert box. And in this very, very basic example, just because of that first content length header that we injected, the web browser ignores the original content that comes from the web server and instead displays our content that we injected in this HTTP URL. So go ahead and research the other Veracode flaws that we talked about. And if you can't find a good explanation or if you'd like clarification, please use our forums and either myself or someone from our community will be able to help. We're also going to look at more common vulnerabilities and attacks in the next lesson, including examples and prevention methods. Looking at reports from prior lessons, we can start to see a pattern in the types of vulnerabilities that can be exploited and which ones are the most common. Organizations like OWASP, SANS, and others have created lists of the top web application security risks so that developers and organizations from around the world can work to minimize these risks. Because we have to understand how our applications can become attacked in order to create the most effective defenses. So let's take a look at the OWASP top 10 web application security lists so you can see what I mean. Keep in mind, there are other lists like the SANS list and other ones out there, but we'll be focusing on the OWASP top 10. The top 10 web application security risks are number one, injections, broken authentication, sensitive data exposure, XML external entities or XXEs, broken access control, security misconfiguration, cross-site scripting or XSS, insecure deserialization, and using components with known vulnerabilities, and last but not least, insufficient logging and monitoring. Some of these should already look familiar because they were covered in the OWASP proactive controls list that we reviewed in another lesson, but this list goes into much more detail about each security risk. Now keep in mind that this list is from 2017, however, OWASP is planning on collecting data in 2020 to see what has changed since then, and you can see more information about that on this tab labeled Data 2020. So while this is a great starting point for us, we can't just rely on this list or other lists. As application security engineers, we have to constantly look out for what's happening in the industry, and we can't just rely on one or two top 10 lists. I'm just throwing that out there as a disclaimer, don't get overwhelmed, but also don't think it just stops here. In any case, clicking on each of these brings up their individual cards. For example, if we click on the injection one, here's what we can see. At the very top, we'll see something familiar to us. We have threat agents and attack vectors, we have security weaknesses, and we have the impacts. In the threat agents and attack vectors, they include factors that are specific to our application, which only us can determine, 
And then we also look at a rating for exploitability. The security weaknesses show the prevalence as well as detectability. And then under impact rating, we have the technical impact and the business impact, which is also something that only us can determine. Now, of course, these are specific to your application as we saw in the threat modeling lesson, but OWASP aims to give us a general idea for each of these. And there is also a PDF version. In the PDF version, they explain how they calculated these and they'll also show them all in one table so that we can see how they ordered them in terms of highest to lowest risk. So if you want more information on that, please check out the PDF document. Next, we get guidance on how we can determine whether our application is vulnerable to this form of attack. So in the case of injections such as SQL or SQL injections, as you may have heard of them referred to instead, our application is vulnerable if user supplied data is not validated, filtered, or sanitized by the application. This is a recurring theme that you will hear over and over again, but never ever trust user data. You have to assume that the user inputted data is malicious. And they show some examples of what these attacks look like, but let me go ahead and show you in a little bit more detail. Let's say that we have a SQL query that says select everything from the accounts table where the customer ID equals a user inputted ID. In this case, the attacker could modify the ID parameter to instead be a SQL injection, which would look something like this. The red part of the query has a single quote, then a space, then or, then another space, then a one in single quotes equals single quote one. Now this looks pretty weird, especially if you've never seen a SQL injection before, but what will happen is because this URL is structured this way, our code would grab that query and this is what the SQL query would look like. Again, we have the select everything from the accounts table where customer ID equals that data inputted by the user. So what's going on here? Well, with the first quote that's in red here, we're actually telling the SQL interpreter to run an or statement. So we're saying the customer ID equals blank or one equals one and one always equals one, which means that this will always return true. So in this case, the database would actually return every single customer ID. And since we're grabbing all of the rows from that accounts table for every single customer ID, if we have, let's say a million different customers, this query would theoretically return every single bit of information in that accounts table for literally all of those million customers. Obviously big problem. And that's one way that you end up with your username, email, or passwords on the black market for sale. The other thing is injections could also be used to modify or delete data, which could cause even more harm, especially if you don't have proper backups. So to defend against this type of attack, OWASP specifies ways of preventing them. For example, we have to always assume that any user supplied data is always going to be dangerous, as I mentioned earlier. And so we have to use techniques to validate, filter, and sanitize that information. But thankfully, most frameworks and languages will contain methods that do this on our behalf, especially if they're modern. We just have to make sure that they're properly being used because that may not be the default or it may not be what we see on an online tutorial. So if we just copy and paste that code without checking it, we could be introducing that vulnerability. So going back to our SQL injection example from just earlier, a method that we could use to clean up user inputs would escape the single quotes in order to make them harmless. So if we have that exact same query, instead, in this case, after all the data sanitation, this is what it would look like. We're putting a backslash in front of every single user inputted single quote. What this does is it turns it into a string instead of running that or statement. So now we're not escaping. We're not looking at customer ID equals blank or one equals one. We're looking at an entire string, or at least that's the way that the database engine would interpret the statement. So now we've turned that injection into a harmless string. There are other ways of also limiting the impact of a successful attack. So we can add multiple different layers of defense. And if that first or second layer of defense fails, we can limit how many records are being returned with a limit SQL statement, for example. So even if that one equals one is always true, we could limit the customer records return to just one. Because if you're looking at an account page, 
there's really no reason why you would want to see more than one account returned unless it's an organization or something like that. But if it's an individual account, there's no reason that would happen. So your SQL statement should just have a limit of one. The problem with that is there are injections that can bypass that limit statement. So this is really a fail safe as a last resort, but it's not something to use by itself. It's something to use in addition to other techniques. As I said, and as you can see here, there are other example attack scenarios. So we looked at one of these in other pages. There may be multiple different types of examples for the different attacks, which is very helpful. And then of course, there's a ton of different amazing references that OWASP has put together for us. There's some references from OWASP, but they also include references that are external, so we can take a look at those. So SQL injections are really nasty attacks. And the problem is, they're still being used fairly frequently today. For example, some fairly recent and high profile examples of SQL injection attacks include companies like Target, Yahoo, Zappos, Equifax, Epic Games, LinkedIn, Sony, and, and many others. So these types of attacks are still definitely being used. The second vulnerability that we'll look at today is broken authentication. Because so many applications have been compromised over the years, username and password lists have become very easy to get a hold of. If improper authentication security is used for an application, attackers can use those lists to do credential stuffing attacks, which attempt the username and password combinations of millions of records to see if any of them work on your application. Other attacks try to use default username and password combinations, or you can have automated brute force attacks, which try millions of passwords to see if any of them work, or dictionary attacks that create combinations using words in the dictionary. And all it takes is one admin or high value account to be compromised for authentication attacks to be worth the effort. And in this case, an application is vulnerable to this type of attack if it allows automated attacks, or if it allows brute force attacks, default, weak, or well-known passwords, such as password one or admin, admin combinations, or if it uses weak or an ineffective credential recovery and forgot password processes. So even if your login methods are super solid, but your forgot password process is weak, that could be used to hijack an account. Other ways that your application would be vulnerable to this is if you use plain text passwords or weakly encrypted and hashed passwords, or if you have missing or ineffective multi-factor authentication, if you expose session IDs and URLs, which can be used for something called URL rewriting, or an attacker can steal your session, if it does not properly rotate session IDs after successful login, or if it does not properly invalidate session IDs after logout or after inactivity. Again, if you spent some time reviewing the proactive controls from a prior lesson, a lot of these should sound very familiar, and the ways of preventing will also look familiar. But the overall recommendations here are to implement multi-factor authentication wherever possible. Passwords alone are becoming less and less secure when it comes to authentication, and adding another layer like multi-factor authentication makes it much more difficult to compromise accounts. Also, don't ship or deploy with any default credentials. Don't implement weak password checks, such as testing new or change passwords against a list of the top 10,000 worst passwords. Implementing weak password checks by enforcing a certain password length and by checking for common passwords. Ensuring that the registration, credential recovery, and the general API pathways are hardened against enumeration attacks where enumeration attacks consist of finding patterns that can be exploited. For example, if you've ever seen a login form that tells you whether the username or the password are wrong, as in your username is correct, but the password is incorrect. While these kinds of hints can be helpful to the users of the application, it's also helpful for the attackers because now they know that they have a correct username and all they have to do is find the correct password, which drastically reduces down computational time because now they only have to guess one variable instead of two different variables. So having generic messages such as your username or password is incorrect prevents attackers from knowing whether they have a correct username or not. Another important protection method is to limit or increasingly delay failed login attempts. And then also log all the failures and alert administrators when there seems to be credential stuffing, brute force, or other attacks happening. It frankly baffles me how many platforms still don't prevent brute force attacks on their login pages because even WordPress, for example, at least at the time of this recording, does not prevent brute force attacks on fresh installations. 
you have to either code it yourself or you have to use plugins to turn this protection on. This means that attackers can try millions of combinations for username and passwords without anything preventing them. Now there are, of course, other ways of preventing authentication attacks, but these are the common prevention methods. So go ahead and take a look at some of the example attack scenarios here and feel free to check out the references for more information. In talking about credential stuffing attacks, there was a fairly recent example with, with the company called Nest. You may remember in 2019 that some Nest users were horrified when strangers started speaking to them through their Nest cameras. One of the ways that the attackers were gaining access to these devices was by using credential stuffing attacks. So in response to these issues, Nest forced certain users to change their passwords if they were using compromised credentials. Also, as a quick reminder, you will see the application security verification standard being referenced and linked to in these documents because many of the requirements we explored in prior lessons help prevent these types of attacks. We're simply looking at why those types of requirements are so important to have when working on applications. Okay, so we've looked at a couple of the top 10 security risks so far, and there are still eight more. As we complete this lesson, go ahead and review them as we've been doing. And if you have any further questions, please use the forums for this course. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next lesson. Another type of attack that I want to include in this course is called a DOS or denial of service attack. You may have heard of it referred to as a DDOS instead, which is simply a distributed denial of service attack. And while at least up to this point, OWASP has not explicitly called out DOS attacks in their top list that we've looked at, I'm including DOS attacks because they're fairly common and not that difficult to do. So they've been an obvious choice for attackers for many, many years now. Denial of service attacks are a tremendous problem because they can cost a lot of money to organizations by causing disruptions to your applications and therefore causing disruptions to your customers. And it can also result in unwanted behaviors like revealing sensitive information because your systems are malfunctioning when they're crashing or just overloaded. And that can result in information leakage, which we've seen in prior lessons. And the problem with denial of service attacks is they don't always have to do with a vulnerability in your code base. Instead, it could just be that the attack is so tremendous that it overwhelms the infrastructure powering your application. So even if you haven't coded in any vulnerabilities or have any security issues in the application itself, if there's an overload of requests and your infrastructure can't handle it, then it will bring your application to its knees. With that said though, there are ways to protect against these types of attacks and we're going to look at that in this lesson. But first, let's back up for a minute and let's talk a little bit more about what a DOS or DDoS attack is. The point of a denial of service attack is to deny service to legitimate users. And this could happen to websites, email, or really any service that relies on computers or a network. And an attack like this is accomplished by flooding the system with so much traffic that the underlying systems can't handle any more requests. A distributed denial of service attack is the same thing, except the attacker is using multiple different machines to attack the same target. The end result usually means a much larger attack and a harder attack to defend against because the requests are coming from so many different locations, so you can't just block one IP address, for example. Research from Kaspersky's Secure List shows that in Q2 of 2019, there were more high profile DDoS attacks than in the prior quarter, and some of which were political in nature versus commercial. Another interesting fact is that China and US ranked as the top two targets for DDoS attacks with 63.8% and 17.5% of the attacks respectively. And Q1 also had seen an increase in attacks by 84% in just three months as compared to the prior quarter. Now, according to a Bulletproof 2019 annual cybersecurity report, a DDoS attack could cost a small business up to $120,000 and up to $2 million for an enterprise organization. And other reports that I've seen have placed these costs even higher than this. And one reason for the sharp increase in attacks in these recent years has to do with the rise of the Internet of Things. More and more devices are becoming connected to the Internet, but their security, honestly, is oftentimes laughable. 
According to a press release from Gartner, the number of IoT devices that are estimated to exist is 20.4 billion by 2020, so this year. Think about connected refrigerators and other appliances, baby monitors, thermostats, and all kinds of other devices. Outside of IoT, there's also your computers and your devices, like your phone, your laptop, PC, etc. And these devices can become compromised and then turned into malicious bot farms, also called botnets. As these devices are compromised, the threat agents can control them with simple commands and have them do whatever they want, from spamming to brute force attacks, DDoS attacks, and everything in between. So what can we do to defend against these types of attacks? Let's start by understanding them a little bit better. If we consider the OSI model, which you might be familiar with if you come from a more networking background, we can group attacks as the infrastructure layer and the application layer attacks. There are other types, but we will focus on some of the bigger ones for this lesson. Let's start with the infrastructure attacks. These types of attacks are usually at layers three and four, and they include attack vectors like SYN and UDP floods. And if you're not familiar with either of those, I do recommend a quick lookup or feel free to ask in our forums. In any case, these attacks are usually larger in volume and their aim is to overload the capacity of the network or the application servers. Fortunately, these attacks can be easier to detect, which typically makes them easier to defend against. On the other hand, we have application layer attacks, which are usually at the layer six and seven. They're typically smaller in volume, but they can do more damage with fewer resources and they can be difficult to defend and prevent because the traffic can be made to look legitimate. For example, a flood of HTTP requests to a login page could take down the ability for users to log in or even potentially take down the entire application. But detecting bot requests versus legitimate requests can be difficult depending on the sophistication of the attack. So now that we know the two different main types, we can start to look at defense mechanisms. The first one that I recommend is reducing the attack surface area by limiting the exposure of your application and its resources to the outside world. And you can do this by hiding resources in private networks, like hiding databases and making them only accessible from inside those networks, which is a best practice for other reasons anyway. Now, this doesn't mean that the attacker cannot take down your database by making your application run expensive database queries over and over again, but at least they can't attack the database directly. And we can also do this by restricting ports and protocols that aren't absolutely necessary for your applications. Again, these are things that you should be doing anyway to reduce the potential of other types of attacks, but it's worth repeating here. Another way of restricting the surface area is by using CDNs and load balancers in front of your web servers or other resources. So if you're using a CDN like Cloudflare or CloudFront, then the traffic goes through those servers before reaching your application servers. And they will have other defense mechanisms included for free or for an extra charge. Now I mentioned the use of load balancers in front of resources. And as the name implies, load balancers are typically used to load balance between servers. So if you have four web servers serving traffic for your application, the load balancer chooses which of those four servers to send a request to. And by having four servers, you can theoretically handle more users at one time. But if the attack overwhelms all of those servers, you could have automated scaling that spins up additional ones to handle that additional load. And this can work, sure, but it also means a higher bill, especially if your application is hosted in the cloud. So if your scaling policies end up having to spend, let's say 10 more servers, that automatically increases your cost 10 times for the duration of the attack. You could always use a load balancer in front of just one web server, and it doesn't have to be in front of multiple web servers while still providing some of these benefits. But of course, at that point, it won't be able to balance the load between multiple different web servers. You still just have one unless you're scaling it out. One more method that we'll mention here is using something like firewalls or other services that can detect abnormal traffic and prevent it from making connections. So if your system knows what the normal traffic pattern looks like, it can detect whether something weird is going on. And this can get pretty advanced. And of course, and of course there are premium services that are available for this very reason. Of course, many of the security features and implementations that we've talked about in prior lessons can help defend against DOS attacks. For example, preventing brute force attacks, credential stuffing attacks, even SQL injections, those security mechanisms can also help defend against DDoS attacks. 
Frankly, this is another topic that I could spend hours talking about because I've had the experience of dealing with DDoS attacks in the past and they're not fun. But now that we've covered the basics of DDoS attacks, let's mark this lesson as complete and I'll see you in the next one. 91% and 95% of applications for iOS and Android respectively have some sort of security vulnerability according to a report by Veracode. A different report by Microfocus states that 88% of the mobile apps that they tested had at least one critical or high severity issue in 2018, which was up 20% from 2016. Considering our reliance on mobile applications for our day-to-day -day personal and professional lives, these are pretty scary statistics, especially when you consider the fact that many of us have applications on our phones that control our home security, that could provide access to personal banking and personal finances, that contains images, videos, text messages, and all kinds of personal information that if it landed in the wrong hands could do some serious harm. So as we build our mobile applications, just like we would with web applications, we have to think about security from the very beginning. And we can do that by taking into account the two major platforms, which are iOS and Android. And both of these have unique values and they also provide unique perspectives when it comes to security. With Android, we have an open source platform that gives owners of devices the ability to mess around and customize code, which is fantastic because it provides more flexibility, but it can create weakness in the device's security because we can introduce flaws and vulnerabilities when making modifications. There are also many different manufacturers with their different flavors of software and hardware, which again provides much more flexibility, but potentially at the cost of security. When it comes to updates, some providers or manufacturers may restrict which updates you receive, making it difficult to get the latest version, which is a critical step in keeping your devices secure. Android devices do have the most market share when compared to any other mobile device, including iOS devices, and this can be regarded as a weakness because more users means more attractive targets for hackers. iOS, on the other hand, is not open source, and Apple doesn't release its source code to app developers, and this can create limits, which many users and developers don't like, but those limits can be a positive when talking about security. Apple devices are tightly integrated between the software and hardware, which reduces the number of variances. And iOS releases are pushed to all devices much more quickly, and since there aren't a huge number of manufacturers and different custom devices, users can receive and apply those updates much faster. In any case, both of these platforms have their own share of security risks and threats. So when developing mobile apps, we have to consider that, and we have to do it from the very beginning. We have to think about how data is stored and transferred. We have to think about the APIs that our app is talking to and the vulnerabilities that may be present there. We also have to consider how application permissions can be exploited, how to handle user authentication and authorization, and anything else that may get exploited. In short, we need to think like an attacker, and in the next lessons, we're going to explore different frameworks that help us build mobile application security requirements baselines, as well as look at some of the top mobile risks and ways of preventing against them. And later in the course, we'll take a look at testing tools to help us find issues in our code. And we'll also look at simulation tools that will teach us how to build more secure software. So go ahead and mark this lesson as complete and let's get started. We've looked at the OWASP application security verification standard before, but that version was focused on web applications. So in this lesson, we take a look at the mobile version. While the mobile ASVS or MASVS is very similar to the ASVS that we've already seen, there are a number of differences. For example, the ASVS had three different verification levels while the mobile version has two. The first level is the recommended level for most mobile applications, while the second level is for applications that handle highly sensitive data, such as banking or healthcare apps. Also, the mobile version has a set of reverse engineering resiliency requirements, which we don't have in the web version, and they aim to prevent client-side threats. These are meant to be used in addition to the L1 or L2 requirements, and not as a replacement. The requirements are grouped in eight different categories, which can be viewed and navigated to on the left-hand side. 
It's also important to keep in mind that the MASVS covers requirements to protect mobile applications on the client side and the network communication between the application and the remote endpoints, as well as generic authentication and session management. But it does not have requirements for the remote services, like the web services that are used by the application, such as APIs, for example. That's when the regular ASVS can come into play, but just keep that in mind when you're thinking about the end-to-end -end security. So let's take a look at a few of the requirements, and we'll start with V1, which is all about architecture, design, and threat modeling requirements. Just like with the ASVS, we start our requirements by creating processes to integrate security throughout our software development lifecycle. This will help prevent only considering security at the very end of development, which, as we know by now, is not a security best practice. And some of the references that we have at the bottom here should look very familiar, such as the OWASP threat modeling that we used to figure out which of these requirements are high, medium, or low priority for our application and for our organization. Next, for V2, we talk about data storage and privacy requirements. Data used by mobile applications has unique security considerations. For example, how do we keep data protected if a mobile device is stolen? How do we make sure that the data stored in the phone's keychain is properly encrypted? You can't assume that the keychain is encrypting it for you. And we have to be mindful of data, such as those keychain entries, that persist even after an application is uninstalled. Understanding how data is stored on devices, but also how data is transferred to and stored in the cloud is critical to making sure that the data is secure. And these requirements will help us with that. It also depends on whether you're developing for Android or iOS, and OWASP gives us references for both of the platforms. Like here we have Android testing data storage and iOS testing data storage with two different links. There's something called the OWASP Mobile Security Testing Guide, which we will review in a later lesson. And other references that you may have already noticed here include links to a OWASP Mobile Top 10 list. This is a list similar to the Web Top 10 that we've already reviewed, but this one is focused on mobile applications. Now, the other requirements focus on cryptography, authentication, and session management requirements, network communication requirements, platform interaction, code quality and build settings, as well as resiliency requirements. Please take a look at these after completing this lesson. And as always, if you have any questions at all, please reach out in our forums. And once you're ready, let's move on to the next lesson. Just like for web applications, OWASP has created a top 10 list of mobile application security risks. And this is an incredibly helpful starting point for building a baseline understanding of mobile app security. And as we saw in the prior lesson with the MASVS framework, a lot of the requirement categories link to these pages because they aim to protect our mobile apps from these risks and from other risks as well. Another helpful starting point is a 2018 Now Secure research that tested applications in the App Store and the Google Play Store, and they compiled the number of applications that their tests found to be violating at least one of the OWASP top 10 risks and then breaking it down by which of those risks were more often violated. They found that 85% of applications violated at least one of these top 10 risks. Of those apps, 50% had insecure data storage, and almost the same number of apps used insecure communication. And as you'll see, those two risks are not necessarily the most difficult to protect against in mobile applications, and the first step is knowing about them, but then the second step is to review and to test for them. So let's take a look at a few of these risks, starting with the first and then moving on to the top two from the now secure research. This is the final list from 2016. And as you can see, there's also a 2014 list. If you're curious to find out the differences, you can take a look list by list and see which risks are still current in the 2016 list and which ones have either evolved or disappeared. But for this lesson, we will be focusing on this 2016 list. Let's start with the first risk, which is improper platform usage. Each platform, whether it is Android or iOS, has a certain way of doing things, and failure to follow best practices can lead to vulnerabilities, whether in the mobile application itself 
or with the web services that are powering that mobile app. For example, if we do not properly implement Touch ID security for iOS applications, it's possible that malicious users could bypass this security mechanism to access an application such as a banking app. Now, this is not just theory. There are examples of people bypassing Touch ID because it wasn't implemented correctly. This page helps us understand different and important factors as they relate to improper platform usage. And this should look very familiar to the risk and threat modeling ratings that we saw in a prior lesson. We have threat agents, which are going to be application specific. We also have attack vectors with the ranking of how difficult or easy it is to exploit these attack vectors related to this risk, which in this case, OWASP rates as easy with an explanation of what they are. A lot of the issues associated with the improper platform usage are tied to web services. And since we went over the OWASP top 10 web application security risks in the prior section of this course, please refer to those lessons if you haven't already watched them or if you don't remember what they are. Now, when it comes to the security weakness, OWASP provides a prevalence and detectability. The prevalence labels this risk as being common with an average difficulty of detecting it in your code. The technical impact lists it as severe, but it does depend on which vulnerability is exploited. And business impacts, as we know, is highly dependent on the application and the business. Next, OWASP lists a few ways of figuring out whether your application is vulnerable to this risk. In this case, they list three separate ways. The first is a violation of published guidelines. Each platform, again, has a different way of doing things, and developers can sometimes cut corners to make it easier, faster, or for whatever other reason. And doing this can result in creating vulnerabilities. The second one is a violation of convention or common practice. Many tutorials or documentation can leave out important details or can be misinterpreted by the developer. And the end result is improper implementation that opens up the app to vulnerabilities. The third is unintentional misuses. In some cases, you may be following best practices and all of your intentions are good, but maybe you missed something important or introduced a bug. To help and following this section, they list ways of preventing improper platform usage, which in this case refers to the OWASP web top 10 list that we've talked about. Then they provide a helpful list of attack examples so that we can see what kinds of attacks could take advantage of this risk. Finally, there is a list of references that we can look into in order to continue researching relevant information. Now, this page overall is structured a bit differently than the web application risks that we saw in the prior section, but it still follows a very similar format, which makes it easy for us to understand and follow. And now that we've reviewed the first risk, let's go ahead and take a look at the second risk, which is about insecure data storage. If you remember, this was the highest found violation in the now secure report that we saw earlier. An example of this happening is in 2014 with an app called Tinder, which was a very popular dating application. However, it was sending users exact locations in order to figure out which users were near your location, except the location data was not encrypted properly. And so people figured out how to find this data on their smartphones and see exactly where other users lived. So insecurely storing data can result in identity theft, privacy violation, fraud, reputation damage, and other losses or damages. And this risk is not just relevant if someone's phone gets stolen. It can also be exploited by malware or other means like the example that we just talked about. And just because you store something in the keychain, SQL databases, cookies, SD cards, on the cloud or really anywhere else, you can't assume that it's being encrypted. You have to assume the opposite and you have to plan accordingly. Now, in the case of this risk, the exploitability factor is easy because if an attacker gets physical access to the mobile device, they can literally just hook that device up to their computer and with freely available software, they can see all third-party application directories and go through them. But they don't even have to have physical access to the mobile device though they could create malware or modify the application to send them this information. The security weakness prevalence rating is common and the detectability is average. We can check that important data is being encrypted using similar tools that would be used to exploit the vulnerability.
and we can also check which encryption libraries are being used to make sure that they're strong enough and that they don't have any known issues. Again, we've talked about this, but never ever use your own encryption. Use popular encryption libraries that have been vetted by experts. And these are just a couple of ways that we can detect problems with storing data. The technical impact can be severe and the business impact depends as usual, but that could certainly also be severe. Determining whether your application is vulnerable to this and preventing the risk requires that you check how and where your important data is being stored. Again, don't make assumptions, instead, verify. And again, we can see example attack scenarios. And in this case, they are including an application called iGo, which is maintained by OWASP, and it provides a learning tool for iOS application pen testing that illustrates these risks. Androgo is a similar type of application, but this time it's for Android instead of iOS. So feel free to look into these. In a later section, we'll talk a little bit more about application testing for both the web and also for mobile. So we'll probably see these tools again. All right, the third and last one that we'll look at in this lesson is about insecure communication. This was the third highest violation in that report that we saw earlier. And insecure communication has to do with how data is transferred and the fact that attackers can intercept that data while it's traveling. And this can happen if you're sharing a local network, such as a compromised or open Wi-Fi that's being monitored. So think of coffee shops, hotels, and so on. Or it could be carriers or network devices like routers, cell towers, etc., that are compromised. Or it could be that you have malware on your mobile device. So making sure that communication is encrypted when it travels is critical, especially if it is sensitive data. The problem is you could implement secure protocols, but that doesn't ensure that the application is using it correctly. Perhaps the encryption setup was poorly done, and so attackers can do what's called a man-in-the-middle attack. Be sure to look that up if you're not familiar with what a man-in-the-middle attack is. Or perhaps the encryption is properly configured, but the application uses a call that does not go through that encryption. There's a number of different scenarios that we have to be cautious of and test for when we're building mobile apps. And by the way, this is not just for Wi-Fi connections. It's important for Bluetooth, NFC, 3G, audio, and really any other type of communication technology that a mobile phone might use. So go ahead and review this page, just like we've been doing for the other two risks, and then be sure to review the other seven risks as well. The other seven risks have to do with insecure authentication, insufficient cryptography, insecure authorization, client code quality, code tampering, reverse engineering, and extraneous functionality. Especially look at the extraneous functionality one because it was the third highest violation in the report that we saw earlier. But as I say that, do keep in mind that that doesn't necessarily make it the most important risk. The other risks are also just as important. And as you go through these, think about how you could apply them to your current or future mobile applications. You can even think back to some of the older applications that you've worked on where maybe they had some of these vulnerabilities, but you weren't aware of the risks and so you just didn't realize it. And once you're familiar with these risks, go ahead and mark this lesson as complete and I'll see you in the next one. Given that the public cloud platforms can be accessed from the open internet, identity and access management, also known as IAM, is more important now than ever. Users can connect from almost any location and any device, even if they are not company owned and the same goes for systems. So to help with this, the major cloud providers, being AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud, bundle IAM with their services. This means that you have a central location where you can manage access controls and permissions, and as you use or deploy more services, you have to define what those access controls and permissions look like. IAM follows the principle that everything and everyone gets an identity, so if an individual needs access to something, they get an identity. And if an API, application, or really anything else also needs to interact with another resource, they also get an identity. And as verification occurs, IAM checks policies to identify the limits of that relationship. So let's say, for example, that you deploy an application to Amazon Web Services on a server, which they call EC2 instances. That application needs to access data that you've also stored on AWS with a service called Amazon S3. In order to limit access 
to the data from your application, a best practice would be to create a role for your application to assume. And that role would have a policy granting it access to that data. This is a big difference compared to using a username and password or some kind of secret key because you don't have to hard code any credentials into your application to access that data when you use roles. This means that you don't have to worry about hiding secrets from your repository or hiding secrets from other employees or anything like that. The role assigned is assumed by the application whenever it needs access. The other great benefit of roles is that you can change their permissions on the fly. So if it turns out that you need to modify a role's permissions because you recently discovered that it provides access to data that you didn't mean to include, instead of having to change the username and password or secret key, you simply update the policy and then that change propagates to any entity that has the assumed role. And the same goes for APIs or really any service that you could use in the cloud. For example, as you create an API, you can have IAM authentication for methods such as GET or POST, and you can control which identity is able to invoke those API calls. You can also manage who has access to creating and managing your APIs. Now, understanding IAM could be its own course, especially since it depends on the platform and the services that you're using, but let's take a quick look at an example with AWS. We've logged into our AWS account and now we're in the IAM service. From here, we can create a number of things like users, roles, and groups. We've also talked about policies and we can find policies here, either customer managed policies or AWS created policies. Let's start by creating a user. We already have a user here by the name of Christoph and we can see that he's in the group admin. He does not have an access key. He does have a password, however, it's been 46 days since he's last changed it. So we may want to change our password policies to force users to modify their passwords more frequently or less frequently, depending on our policy stance. We can also see last activity and whether they have multi-factor authentication enabled, as well as what kind of multi-factor authentication has been enabled. We can go ahead and add a new user. From here, we can select a username such as test, we can also create multiple different users through the same process. We can set programmatic access, which enables an access key ID and a secret access key, which can be used for the AWS API, CLI commands, SDK commands, or other development tools. So if we're doing local development, for example, or development in a different cloud or even on-prem, we can use these access key IDs and secret access keys to communicate with our AWS services. We can also enable AWS Management Console access, which enables a password that allows the user to sign in to the AWS Management Console, just like we are currently. So what I'll do is select this. From there, we can either auto-generate a password or set a custom password, and then we can enforce that the user must change the password upon signing in, which we'll leave at the default. Next, we select permissions. From here, we can either add a user to a group we can copy permissions from existing users, or we can attach existing policies directly. What I'll do is create a new group. So we'll name this test group. And for now, I won't assign any policies to this group. So this user won't have any access. We can also set permissions boundaries, which allow us to control the maximum permissions that a user can have. And this is an advanced feature used to delegate permission management to others. We won't take a look at that for now. We can tag with a key and value. I won't do anything here. Then we can review and finally we can create this user. We can show the password, we can send an email with instructions, or we can do whatever else our policies dictate to provide this user with their username and password. Let's go ahead and close this for now. And then we'll go to roles so we can see how this is different than users. So this has a brief explanation of what an IAM role is. We've already talked about this a little bit, so I'll go ahead and create a role. Now, as we know, roles are a bit different than users in that they can be assumed by users and they can also be assumed by systems. So first we have to select a type of trusted entity, whether it's an AWS service, another AWS account, such as an account belonging to us or a third party. It could also be a web identity. And we'll take a look at this a little bit more in the securing APIs lesson right after this or SAML 2.0 for corporate directories.
and selecting the AWS service allows AWS services to perform actions on our behalf. If we click this instead, we can see how that changes. But in this case, we have to think about what the role will be used for. In our prior example, where we have an application hosted on EC2 instance that needs access to Amazon S3, we would make sure that this role grants access to the specific data on Amazon S3 and the specific actions that should be allowed, and the service assuming this role will be EC2. So we'll go ahead and select EC2. This is where you create and or assign a policy. And this is where you would say that I want to grant whoever assumes this role, which would be an EC2 instance, access to our specific Amazon S3 data. So the, the way that we can do this is by either selecting an existing role, which is a great way to get started quickly just to try things out, but usually you'll want to customize it a whole lot more than the default. So what I can do is create a brand new policy. From here, we can either use a visual editor or we can create our own JSON. Either way, it ends up spitting it out as JSON, which is our configuration. So in this case, I'll select a service, which will be Amazon S3. Then it populates the actions that we can choose. So in this case, I'll say read and write. And then I can either leave it as this, or I can specify exact resources. So I can say specific resources or all resources. And to specify a resource, I can either use an access point, a bucket, a job, or an object. And from there, we specify something called ARN, which means Amazon resource name. That is the unique identifier for whatever we're looking at. So if we have an object stored in S3, it would have a unique ARN, and we can specify that unique ARN in order to say that Amazon EC2 or the EC2 instances that are assuming this role only have access to this specific object ARN or multiple different object ARNs. Now in this case, I actually don't have any data in Amazon S3, so I'm going to leave it blank, but keep in mind you can and should definitely do this. You can also specify other request conditions, such as whether MFA is required and whether it should come from a specific source IP. Again, I'll leave this empty for now, but keep in mind that you can and probably should turn that on. So as I try to review the policy, it will say that it contains an error because we're required to choose a resource since we had selected it earlier. What I'm going to do instead is just click all resources. From there, we can give it a name. I'll just name it test policy. We can give it a description, which is highly recommended. And then we get a summary of what this policy looks like. Let's go ahead and create it. Now that we've created our test policy, we can go back here, refresh, and search for test policy. And we see it here. Again, we can expand to take a look at what it looks like. We can look at a policy summary, and we can also see the JSON of what this policy is. We can see all the actions, and we can see the resource, which the asterisk in this case means all resources. I should have also pointed out that the effect is allow we could have an explicit deny, which would explicitly deny all these actions on the specified resources. Let's go ahead and create this. So we created this policy for the role, and now we've created the role. It's similar to how we created the user, just again has slightly different purposes. But you can start to see that this can get complicated very quickly, and it's easy to lose sight of what access is, and more importantly, is not granted. There are a number of resources in AWS and outside of AWS that can help with creating the right policies, such as the IAM policy simulator. We can click on that user that we created. We can see that there are no current policies for that user. We can create a new policy to see what it looks like, and then we can run simulations. So we can select a service, such as API Gateway. We can select Actions, and then we can run a simulation. We can see that they are denied by an implicit deny. The implicit deny is there because we have not given permissions. Therefore, AWS assumes that it's not permitted and denies it. But if we had an explicit deny instead, that explicit deny cannot be overridden. So you can see that these kinds of policy simulators can help you make sure that you're not giving too much access.
And as you learn to use the AWS services of your choice, this is definitely an area that you'll want to spend some time on and think through in detail. The last part that we had mentioned talking about is groups. So if we click on groups, we can see the admin group and we can see the test group that we had created prior to this. We have the test user, but we don't have any permissions. So from here, we could attach a permission. In this case, I can also use the test policy. And now this group with all of its users would have similar privileges than the role we created because they both assumed the same policy. So we can actually use policies for multiple different reasons and we can manage them all from here. We can also simulate directly from here. So hopefully this quick walkthrough of AWS IAM was helpful. There's a whole lot more to it, but we don't have time to go through all of that now. But the first step is being aware that there are mechanisms in place to help protect your applications, your data, and your cloud infrastructure. The second step is to follow best practices, such as locking down and not using the root account that's created for you and has the ultimate power when you create a new cloud account. Also, using groups to assign permissions to users instead of stacking individual policies per user, which makes it much harder to keep track. And perhaps more importantly, granting least privileges, which means only giving the exact permissions necessary and nothing more. Even though we're all short on time and it's so easy to give a wide range of permissions and be done with it, we need to take the time to identify exactly what permissions a user or system needs. Now, as we wrap up this lesson, please take the time to review the IAM service for whichever cloud provider you're most comfortable with. Pull up the documentation and spend some time reading about the best practices. And once you've done that, it's time to move on to the next lesson where we explore building secure APIs in the cloud using the OWASP top 10 list. Let's take the OWASP top 10 list that we've already reviewed and let's use it to build a secure API in the cloud. And for this example, we're going to use the AWS platform as our cloud provider. Now, most of the concepts will apply to other cloud providers as well, but some of the terminology and services that we'll show in the example will be AWS specific. Now, as we build this API, we're going to have to consider the following. Identity and access with broken authentication and broken access control being a couple of the main risks that we'd want to worry about here from the OWASP top 10 list. Then our code, where we might expect to see things like injection attacks, XXE attacks, cross-site scripting attacks, insecure deserialization, or components with known vulnerabilities. Then comes the data, where we might have sensitive data exposure. After that, we have to worry about the infrastructure itself, and we might see some components with known vulnerabilities here. And finally, but definitely not least, logging and monitoring, where we might have insufficient logging and monitoring, which is from the OWASP top 10 list. Now, one of the ones I haven't mentioned yet that goes across pretty much all of these is going to be security misconfiguration. So this kind of applies all over the place. For this example, we're going to pretend like we're using the API gateway from AWS, and then we'll also pull in other supporting services. So let's get started by breaking it down. First comes identity and access. When it comes to identity and access for our API, we have to consider the two important risks from the OWASP, which are broken authentication and broken access control. So we've already looked at AWS IAM, we have a basic understanding of roles, users, policies, etc., and we already know that this can be directly used to grant access to our APIs. AWS also has a service called Amazon Cognito with user pools that can be used to control who can invoke our REST API methods. And a third option is through Lambda authorizers, which lets you implement a custom authorization scheme. So you could use something like OAuth or SAML if you're familiar with those. So when it comes to securing access to managing and creating APIs in your cloud accounts, or when it comes to controlling who can invoke your API methods, we have those three main options. And to complement those options, we can also use API keys that allow customers access to selected APIs with the ability to set usage plans that dictate how much and how fast they can use your API. But before we even authorize a call to access our API methods, we can and should 
add another layer of defense via a web application firewall. Conveniently, AWS also has a service that goes by that name, which we'll call AWS WAF for short. With AWS WAF, we can deny access to requests based on a set of rules called web access control lists that allow, block, or count web requests based on customizable web security rules and conditions that you define. For example, you can create rules that block specific IP addresses, CIDR blocks, requests that originate from a specific country or region, requests that contain malicious SQL code, requests that contain malicious scripts, brute force attacks, and so on. The WAF basically acts as your first line of defense even before other access control features are checked, like IAM, Cognito, or whatever else you're using, and way before those attempted attacks reach a single line of your code. Now, AWS WAF is not your only option. There are many other web application firewalls available from third parties, such as via Cloudflare. And one more check that I'll mention in this section involves cross-origin resource sharing, also known as CORS. CORS is a browser security feature that restricts cross-origin HTTP requests that are initiated from scripts running in the browser. Now that sentence alone should raise your internal gut feeling that some nasty things can happen. Thankfully, portswigger.net has an excellent breakdown of cores and attacks that can happen when it is misconfigured, so we won't spend much time on it, but the API gateway does support cores configuration as a way of protecting our APIs. So once we've gone through our first layer of defense, a request then gets directed to our actual code where the magic happens. And this is another point at which attacks can be executed against our API, especially these types of attacks. Injections, like SQL injections, XML external entity injections, or XXEs, cross-site scripting, or XSS, insecure deserialization, and using components with known vulnerabilities. Now, hopefully at this point, our configured web application firewall has blocked these attacks from reaching our code, but we can't just assume that. We have to assume that the attacks will breach our initial defenses. One first step to consider is verifying where the API requests are coming from once they've reached our code. Now we've already talked about checking where requests are coming from as they travel from the open internet to our API gateway, but we also have to consider whether they're actually coming from the API gateway when we get to the actual code. Since API gateway serves as a gateway to your API, we want to make sure that requests are actually coming from that API gateway and not just some random location. And one way we can do that is with SSL certificates. We can use API gateway to generate an SSL certificate and then use its public key to verify that HTTP requests to your backend systems are coming from API gateway. And if the key doesn't match up, then we reject the request. Otherwise, we go ahead and accept it. And once we've accepted the request because it made it through the first layer and it passed our SSL certificate check, we can then process the request. The code processing this request cannot trust any user inputs. I know we've talked about this repeatedly at this point, but before we use any of those inputs, we have to sanitize that data. And as we'll explore in a later section of this course, we also have to look out for components with known vulnerabilities. And these components could be open source or even closed source libraries that we pull in and use for our code or our APIs. And those components could be bringing in vulnerabilities. When it comes to data related to our APIs, we have to consider the sensitive data exposure risk listed in the OWASP top 10. We talked about generating SSL certificates to check communication between our API gateway and our API code, and that's a great start. But in addition to this check, we need to consider the end-to-end -end of how and where our data travels. For example, first, the request gets sent to our API from, let's say, the open internet. Next, our API pulls data from a data store, like a database or other storage. Third, the API processes that data. And fourth, the API sends back a response to the requester. At each of those steps, the data is either at rest, in transit, or in use. And just like we can use encryption from API gateway to our code, we can use encryption for connections made to our API. 
We can also enforce encryption connections from our API to our database or from our API to another data storage, such as Amazon S3. And even once the data is transferred to its data store location, we can encrypt data at rest by turning on server-side encryption. So if we're storing some of our data in Amazon S3, we can enable that encryption. And if we're storing data in a database, we can encrypt that as well, especially if it's sensitive data. And while the data is in use by your API code, we can help keep it protected by using something called hashing. And this technique creates a hash of the original data for comparison purposes. So if we're verifying a password, we would use the hash of that password. And if it matches up, then we grant access. There can also be something called salting, which adds a unique random string of characters known only to the application that is applied before the hashing process. And this can help in the event that the hashing used by your application becomes compromised. And in the case that multiple users have the same password, like if they're using a horrible password, such as password one, two, three, four, five, six, and one user's password ends up getting cracked, the attacker would not be able to see all of the other users that have the exact same password because salting would make the hash look different. And salting also increases the computational complexity of the password and hash since it's making it longer and therefore it's making it safer than just hashing alone. So these are some ways of protecting data from end to end, whether it is in use, in transit, or at rest. Next, we have to consider infrastructure. When it comes to protecting the infrastructure powering our APIs, we also have to take into account components with known vulnerabilities, since each of the components we're using could have vulnerabilities, whether it's our web server software, load balancer software, or any other component. And while your organization may have different teams that handle infrastructure, nowadays, a lot of times, especially with smaller organizations like startups, the developers themselves are having to deal with at least part of the infrastructure. So being aware of this is very important. The second risk that we have to be aware of is protecting against DDoS attacks. We've already reviewed these in a prior lesson, and we've talked about tools in this lesson that could help mitigate these attacks, such as the AWS WAF, and we could even throttle requests through the API gateway. So I won't go into more detail for DDoS attacks. Okay. Last, but definitely not least. This is one of the important risks listed in the OWASP top 10 that we really haven't spent a whole lot of time on, even though it is a critical component. While there is a plethora of logging and monitoring tools available for free or for a cost, AWS has a service called Amazon CloudWatch that natively integrates with API Gateway. CloudWatch offers predefined metrics, such as performance metrics for API calls, latency and error rates, and we can also create custom metrics and we can use CloudWatch logs in order to log API execution errors or really any information that we want. And this not only helps with debugging, but it can also help with identifying failed or successful attacks. For example, if you create an alarm that monitors error rates and all of a sudden you receive notifications that there's a large increase in error rates, you can take a look and realize that the errors are caused by someone trying to attack your API. Or as you investigate a breach, you may find breadcrumbs left behind in logs. So monitoring and logging, at least when it comes to security, serves two major purposes. Number one is to stop attackers who are probing your systems in the hope of finding vulnerabilities. And number two, identifying a breach, including how it happened and the extent of damages inflicted. Now, the good part of using a separate tool such as CloudWatch is that you do not simply store logs locally, and then you can trigger certain analysis and alarms when important conditions are met. And by the way, monitoring and logging should not just be enabled for API Gateway. It should also be enabled for all of the services, including AWS WAF, IAM servers, databases, storage, and etc. In this lesson, I hoped to accomplish two different goals. And my first goal was to introduce the concept of building secure APIs, especially in a cloud setting, since many of us already have or will be building APIs. And then the second goal was to start tying in the OWASP top 10 list that we've already reviewed multiple times throughout this course, but to tie that into an actual practical real world example. And the other neat thing to observe is that many of the concepts that we've learned for web application security can also apply to cloud application security and vice versa. 
So as we learn one, we are seeing some overlap with other specialties, which is important when we're looking to build our skill set. So I hope that I've accomplished these goals in this lesson. And I know it's a lot to chew on because we looked at a lot of different information. So please take your time to digest it. And then when you're ready, let's move on to the next lesson.